I want to welcome my guest now, the author of the book Dragon Flame, Mr. Lauren Leo, to the show. Lauren, uh, a real pleasure to talk to you. I know that uh, this is a couple weeks in the making having you on the show. Thank you for being here, sir. No problem. Thank you for having me on. Now, I want to you know, get my audience uh, introduced uh, to your work and to your background a little bit before uh, uh, we continue on. So before we start talking about the book, which is a great book, by the way, I've been going through it all week, uh, but I wanted to, uh, to, like I said, introduce them to your background and to your, to your history as a writer. Uh, can you talk about your past a little bit before we get into the book? Yeah, like sure. That? I've been uh, researching the occult and magic high magic, low magic, Wicca, for years. Been curious about it since I was a little boy, actually. And I've traveled extensively throughout uh, the United States and um, Western Europe through um, also uh, the Middle East as well and study the occult. I also have great practices from the Western Mystery School, Golden Dawn, as well as um, basic Wicca tradition. And uh, I never considered myself a writer until recently, and uh, that all came about because of Dragon Flame and the actual talisman that came to me. So the Not- the background of researching the occult for all of those years culminated in the vision of the Dragon Flame talisman. Gotcha. Now you said you were a member of the Golden Dawn, right? I, I studied. The Golden Dawn. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're actually the second person I've had on the show who studied the Golden Dawn. Uh, another person by the name of Brian McComas. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he went by the handle of Divini. I uh, used to be on the show a lot, and uh, he, you know, talked to us a lot about the Golden Dawn and the Kabbalah on the show. Now you study the Kabbalah also in part of your studies. Uh, you know, what interested you in, in these subjects uh, growing up? I mean, what was it that got you interested in, in learning about this stuff? Well, the Kabbalah really. I've learned from studying it for so many years, and actually at this point, let's differentiate between the rabbinical Kabbalah and the practical Kabbalah. The the rabbinical or Hebraic Kabbalah is monotheistic, and I study the practical Kabbalah, which is pantheistic, polytheistic, has more gods, goddesses, and um, it's really the backbone of magic. Uh, the belief system allows you to work magic. Um, and what got me interested in it, I think, was just sheer curiosity and wanting to learn more about magic and, at the time, wanting to learn more about myself, how to further develop psychic ability and learn more sacred knowledge so it was really curiosity. I, I would say that was the motivating factor and also trying to understand myself and understand you know, where I was headed in life. You know, Kabbalah has a, an amazing way of doing that for someone that if you study it long enough and diligently, it changes your life. Now, when you say magic, can you explain to us a little bit of uh, what kind of magic we're talking about? Uh, yeah, well, my book, Dragon Blame, it covers all the different genres of magic. It mm-hmm. covers what's known as low magic or Wicca and high magic. So the difference in low magic and high magic, according to me, in my opinion, is really the practice of the Kabbalah. So low magic or Wicca has to do with more of the natural Mother Earth magic, um, religion, um, the high magic is based more in practical Kabbalah and the vibration of God names. So there's a, a, a difference between the two, and it's highly debatable, but in my opinion, that's the, the biggest difference between the two. And my oh, book okay. has both. So I, I, talk, I talk about Wicca and witchcraft. I talk about high magic and the practical Kabbalah, how to utilize both. But I also throw a smattering of alchemy in as well. And really the the crux of my book is about self-transformation. It's how do you change your life using magic? And that's where a lot of the motivation came from in myself as well to write the book. And alchemy is really evolution. It's how do we evolve quicker? 
and it, it's a process that changes your life immediately as soon as you start to look into it because it, we're all evolving, but at what rate? We want to evolve quicker. So that's really what my book's about. Um, how do you evolve quicker? Really, how do you utilize alchemy? How do you utilize it in the proper way to change your life? And my book is the magical formula for that, which boils down to something very simple. It's concepts, three concepts. Goal plus purpose plus sacrifice equals guided change. And really, those are the three concepts that you need to make magic work. So, you know, the, my definition of magic is utilizing something more than your physical body. I believe we're more than our physical body. We can utilize energies to create our destiny. I think we work 50-50 with destiny. Um, and if we use this magical formula, then we can create our goals. We can change our lives. Question: Were the the, the secrets with the secrets uh, or the laws of attraction uh, would that come into play with some of the, the the stuff you're talking about with magic? It does. I mean, I'm asked that often. It comes into play only because they are really a common denominator in right. magic. They're hermetic axioms, and what I mean by that is that they are laws of the universe. Um, one of the major hermetic axioms that I use in my book is as above, so below, which really uh, means what we think. I'm making this very, very simple, but what we think is what we're going to ultimately manifest. Right. And there's a great truth behind that. If you concentrate on something long enough and hard enough, somehow, some way, you're going to attract that into your life. You're going to create what you want and bring it into your trajectory. So how do you do that properly? So I have a lot of clients that ask me, you know, look, I'm, I'm really curious about magic. I want to change my life. I don't know how to do it. I'm lighting candles. They're not working for me. Um, I, I'm focusing on creative visualization, and it's not materializing the way I want it to. And why? And, you know, why, why is it working for you and not for me? So my answer to them is that it took many, many years for me to learn how to make it work for me uh, through trial and error and studying and messing up and finally having a spontaneous illumination and a lucid dream of this talisman, dragon flame, and the, the formula and the concept. So the, the concept of creating a goal, aligning it with a purpose, and consciously choosing a sacrifice will create guided change. It will change your life. It will help you. So it's not something that can be expected immediately. You can't expect an immediate result from it. I mean, sometimes that happens, but it's a slow process and you have to study it and focus on the formula and it does work. I mean, it's how I changed my life. It's how I wrote my book. Now, you go through on the book here different colors of, uh, the, of uh, I guess, uh, the colors of spirituality, color of desire, the color of the sun, uh, you know, different colors of the talisman. Um, can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? What's the difference between the different colors? Sure, sure. Well, you know, and colors have different connotations for everyone. So for me, I can look at the color gray and the power in it because to me, gray is utilizing both the white and pure aspect of who you are and also the black or dark aspect. And we're both. If we don't understand that we're both good and bad at the same time or positive and negative at the same time, then we're really shunning this part of us and we're not learning from it. We're, we're living in fear. So whenever we say that we're going to create something, a goal or a concept and start to bring it into our life, we want to do it with all of the power that we have. If you want to utilize all of your power, 
then you're going to utilize all of who you are. So to me, that's both white and black, and that mixture together creates gray. So that's one of the most important colors, I believe, uh, is the mixture of who we are, our entirety. Um, now, as far as the other colors, those take on different connotations as well. And you can look at the color blue and um, think of air and air, the element of air in magic represents thoughts and how to utilize your thoughts. And the more we hone our thought, we can perfect our craft, whatever that may be, whatever the talent is that we're trying to work on. Um, you know, and gold is the color of the sun, is the color of enlightenment, our higher self. So the colors come into play uh, very powerfully, and um, we work with symbols uh, every day of our life. They, they speak to us in a nonverbal fashion. It's very important. That's why I also use tarot in the book. And I describe the different concepts behind magic, behind the dragon flame symbol and talisman, the color and the tarot, because these are images that speak to us in a nonverbal fashion and actually stimulate or awaken a latent energy within us. That's very true. You know, uh, the reason I brought the color uh, scheme up is uh, because it, it is identifiable with just about every symbolism, even the symbolism that we get uh, within uh, society today, you know, with uh, icons for companies and logos and, and, and all the symbolism that's out there. A lot of the colors they use are based on this. I mean, it's basically uh, made to get your attention, to talk to you with, you know, in, this, in a uh, almost a subliminal way. Oh, absolutely. I agree. I mean, it's, and it's also put together by people that are strategizing. Right. You know, this is it's people that are thinking in uh, a large en masse uh, production. How do we catch people's attention? How do we capture a particular demographic? So, yes, they see the natural, when we say they, anyone that's into advertising, sees the power behind color and the potency in using it in a subliminal fashion. So it does have a great impression on our psyche and it does, it does. awaken latent energies and forces within us. Now let me ask you, how far back does magic uh, go in, in this world? Because I know, you know, Wicca and witchcraft, all that stuff has been around for uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but uh, how far back do you think it actually goes that this information uh, has been available? Hmm, that's a good question. Magic, in my opinion, is timeless. And again, we get into this heavy territory of what's beyond our physical body and our subconscious mind. So, in my opinion, our subconscious mind is connected to what I call the astral realm, which is a realm that is a realm of the mind and our thoughts. It's where everything exists before it exists here on this earth realm. So on the earth realm, we're in three dimensions. It's a slower, heavier vibrational rate. On the astral realm, it's a lighter vibrational rate. It's more ethereal. So it's non-corporeal. So it, it's beyond a third dimension. And that's really where magic exists. Mm. When we say magic, when I say magic, I'm talking about where the energy exists to create initially in order to make change here on the earth plane. So how long has magic existed? It's timeless. I mean, the question can be answered in a kind of chronological approach to history with magic, um, which is interesting, and that's an entirely different conversation. But 
it can also be answered in what I think is a, a more intriguing fashion, which is psychologically and um, esoterically speaking. And it exists and has existed before the earth plane existed. So it's how do you connect to it? If you right. connect to it through your subconscious mind, through altered states, which I talk about altered states in my book. I talk about the alpha state, which is one of the four brainwave states often because it's the alpha state that you want to allow yourself to fall into in order to connect with your subconscious mind and the astral realm in order to manifest your goal on the material realm. Now, do you astral project yourself? Or, I mean, is that something that you've done in the past? I have. Uh, astral projection was something that I had a great interest in. Um, when I realized that the the ability to create change on the earth plane started in the mind's eye or in the subconscious realm or in the astral realm, I, I practiced and meditated to have more control of my unconscious mind and my astral body. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of work in order to have your point of consciousness leave your physical body. I bet. So, now, you, you've been studying this for 30 or three decades. I don't want to say 30, but three decades. How long would it take somebody to learn how to astral project themselves? Everyone's different. Some people have it naturally. They just leave their body naturally. Um, also, uh, according to my studies, everyone leaves their body every night. It's just mm. a matter of remembering the actual right. astral projection. Um, from my own experiences with it, I believe that if you focus on it long enough, and hard enough that if you did a 30-day meditation, that you could have an experience with 30 days, within the 30 days, that it, it, you would have to follow a routine and meditate and calm your mind and bring your attention to your physical body. And also, um, after you bring it to your entire physical body, bring that conscious point to your mind's eye and try to let go of the physical body. Um, and it, it's so much more in-depth, but that's just the beginning approach. I meditated for... It took me... I was naturally inclined to leave my body since I was a little boy. But it took me many years, probably close to 20 years, to wow. be able to have even slight control over it. There are other people that... Sometimes once they enter that state and fall into an altered state for the first time, that they're, they're comfortable with it, and they can do it as often as they like. Everyone's what? different. Everyone's psyche is different. The only common denominator that we all have is the ability to create and the mm -hmm. energy force known as Kundalini that's sitting at the base of our spine. That's a common denominator. We all have that. We all have the ability to be psychic, to create, to use a magical force, to leave our bodies. So much more than just the earth realm and our physical body. Now, what kind of feeling do you get when you're about to leave your body? Is there a physical feeling that you actually get that comes over you? It feels uh, like uh, vibrations coming through you. Okay. And... Uh, your entire body feels like it's filled with vibrations and they, you match that frequency, at least I do. I attempt to match that frequency and as you match that frequency, it frees you from your physical body. And really what that is, it's the expansion of the aura. And when that's happening, when you finally realize that that's what it is, that's when you're able to calm down because it can be very frightening at first because you're experiencing an altered state. And generally, uh, that's what happens when people go to a hypnotherapist. If they go long enough, 
and allow the hypnotherapist to do their work, the person can go to an altered state and as they're entering the altered state, often they become frightened because they don't know what they're experiencing. They stop themselves from experiencing it. A lot of people are frightened by it because it feels like you're dying, like you're leaving your body. You don't know what's happening. Right. But it, my initial, um, for me, when I lay down to leave my body, there's vibrations that come through me. I match that frequency, and if I'm successful on that first attempt, I will be able to free myself of the confines of my physical body. What do you say to people who take like mind-altering drugs like DMT and stuff to like be able to leave their bodies and astral project? A lot of people have taken ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is another one, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and recreational drugs. I, I, I don't I condone that. It's uh, it needs to be under I think that someone needs to know what they're getting themselves into there's a, a risk factor with it how someone is going to respond to um, the effect of the drug whatever it may be but it, it, it does I'm, I'm sure it, it does have an effect on the psyche and on the body and just like any mind altering drug would naturally do so. Um, you know, I, I, I have spoken to many people that have taken ayahuasca and they've experienced an amazing, mind-altering experience that changed their life. Do you think they're uh, astral they projecting there? Do you think they're actually tapping into another uh, form of reality or is it a hallucination on, the, on that? I'm, you know, it, I'm not sure. It it could be a mixture of both where they're hallucinating and also somewhere along the line they're actually able to leave the physical body. But the, the problem whenever you're experiencing an altered state that's been induced by a drug is that you're losing control. It's a loss of control. Right. Um, so if you do it without uh, a drug-induced state, you have more control over it. It takes longer, but at least it, it's a, a purer, cleaner effect to it. It keeps the mind clearer. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that there is an effect from it, and it, it's probably a mixture to answer your question of hallucination. And at one point, I'm sure that there's some kind of psychic experience that comes into play. And it also opens you to, I would think, entities of a lesser nature. Anyone that um, would, let's say, uh, drink too heavily and take a mind-altering uh, drug as well opens you to uh, lesser entities. Uh, that will see an opportunity to um, sort of mess with you, I suppose, if you don't know what you're doing. Hmm, that's so interesting. I, 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 yeah, it's, it opens you up. It, it frees you it's so much so without you being conscious, so you're allowing anything to come into, you, into your body. Most people, it doesn't happen to, thankfully, um, but... You know, we're reaching a more spiritual state with our society. People are more interested in their spirituality and expansion and spiritual growth and psychic ability. Um, we're, we're headed down that path uh, very quickly as time goes on. And you know, with that awareness comes trial and error because we can't evolve unless there's some kind of friction. There's no book that explains how to do this other than mine. <laughs> and you know, there's, you know, there's, you know, honestly though, there's so many books that explain magic and how to utilize it. But those books exist, as do mine, because it's an interpersonal experience that I've had with it. I worked for 30 years or more 
on having experiences and studying and through that had an illumination that allowed me to put my magical formula into writing and share sacred knowledge with people. So there are many, many books sharing interpersonal experiences. They are there because of friction. So people are going to naturally find friction in their life in order to evolve. And I think that's where we're headed. And with that uh, idea in mind, back to your original question, I think that people will and have and will continue to take some kind of mind-altering drug to put them into that state. And if they're psychic by nature, then yes, it could open them up to something of a lesser nature or a lesser entity. Which is interesting. I, you know, where does God come into play in, in all this? Do you think uh, that there is a being God or, or, is, or is reality a little bit different than what we've been uh, led to believe over the course of history? God, to me, is an energy. And I like to say creator. I don't like to put masculine or feminine onto that energy, at least not in the first sentence of describing the concept right. of right, a concept of that which created us. Mm-hmm. So I say creator and if you imagine creator is a source of energy, and out of that source of energy we need to make sense of it in our mind. How do we make sense of that energy? And then it becomes easier for us to categorize. So God, goddess, masculine, feminine. And that's where the Kabbalah comes in handy because it helps us categorize the different energies of creator. But I think that's a great question because it really... It's, uh, it's the understanding of the aspects of ourself, what's within our own internal universe. Right. It, it's not just male and female energy. It also, at one point, is neutral energy coming from one grand source, creator, and well, how we, we utilize that. We know male and female from here on Earth, but you know who's not to say that we're not the only planet that has male and female. Maybe other planets have uh, one sex beings that are the intelligent race. Uh, so we really judge you know God and goddesses by what we know here. To, you know, by what we know of our own species, I guess, male or female. That's right. and, and it's funny because we you know we always look at men as being the the dominating of the two sexes or the more dominating one. That's why God has always been seen as a male by the most part by society. Would you say that's true or fair? I would say that in, again, chronologically in history, that yes, unfortunately there has been a patriarchal sway. And, you know, it, again, that's changing prior to that. It was matriarchal. The woman was able to give life and was therefore revered. And, you know, it's this pendulum swing. We've gone from paganism and the matriarchal society to monotheism and the patriarchal society. And I believe it is now the pendulum is swinging back into, well, of course, neo-paganism and into a more goddess-oriented society. I think it's just a natural rhythm. You know, how, how much of uh, is doing it. How much of religions uh, nowadays uh, borrowed from paganism? Uh, they've borrowed a lot from uh, paganism, from uh, at least Christianity. Is that right? Oh, I believe so. Yes, yeah, historically, the well, remember. <laughs> the paganism was what existed first. Right. There, there was no Christianity until the advent of the ascended master or man known as Yeshua or Jesus. Right. And at that point, history changed. And again, there's a political movement, in my opinion, and I think it just makes sense 
you have the emperor of Rome losing power because there's a new religion coming up. So what does he do? He gets the most important people around him and his counselors and says, look, what do I do? I'm starting to lose power. And of course they tell him, well, look, you know, let's, let's all get together. Let's talk about this and let's work with uh, these new zealots because it's catching on. You don't want to lose power. So we, you know, we have to work with them. And, and there you have the origin of the Bible. So, you know, it's, Again, it's political. If people look at, if society looks at the facts, it becomes very unsettling for people that are very religious and old school because they're listening to what a man at a pulpit learned from another man from another pulpit and the guy who was his mentor. They're learning from a single source. They're not learning the facts. If the facts were brought into it, then it would be looked at from a different perspective. Wouldn't you agree, though, that most of everything that we know in society uh, has been because of that, though? It came from one individual source, and then other sources you know, either quoted it or added to that original source, and it really all just came from an individual at some point? I talk about that in my book, Dragon Flame, and I believe that... The, yes, I mean, and I like to shift that into something called tradition and ancestor worship. And I, you know, we've lost that connection with our ancestors and how to worship our ancestors. And we've lost the respect for tradition. And tradition is very important. And that, I think, is very, um, needs to be put under a mic- microscope and really focused on you know, the tradition that's handed down from one generation to the next of sacred knowledge should be not adhered to, but studied and should be refined. And I, I discuss that in my book, and I actually have a ritual that involves ancestor worship, and they explain how to do that properly. Now, can you go over that a little bit with us? Ancestor worship, and well, it, it's um, the to start properly with that, you would have to talk about the tools that are necessary, such as an altar, and what do you do with the altar? How do you make the altar work? And uh, and, and all of this, by the way, is in complete detail in my book. I discuss what an altar is, how it works properly, how to put up a magic circle, how to protect yourself, because it's very important when you start to um, work with energies and try to create and change your life. So ancestor worship. The first step would be to create a sacred space, obtain an altar, find some pictures of ancestors that are meaningful to you, and look into it. Sometimes there are ancestors that we're unaware of. Hmm. If you're lucky enough to have a great-grandmother or great-grandfather alive, take full advantage of that. Talk to them. They probably have amazing stories to tell. To start with someone alive on the earth plane, (laughs) talk to them, start to get some stories, find pictures. And I go into great detail in my book. And it's under um, the rituals of transformation. You know, there was one part of the book that really got my attention was uh, the medicine wheel, uh, medication for the soul. And uh, there's a quote in there that is, uh, that's really uh, a quote I think everybody knows. Uh, Mother knows best. And uh, mm-hmm. that is so true. Uh, and, and it talks about how, uh, you know, you're, you can repair yourself just by letting Mother Nature and the Earth repair you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I truly believe that everything we need to heal ourselves is here. It's been given to us. It's within Mother Nature. It's within Mother Earth. 
And I believe that slowly but surely, as history has shown us, it is being revealed to us. And sooner or later, we're going to, modern science will come across something, an herb, an essence, something that will be able to heal us completely. In the meantime, we can utilize the energy of Mother Earth in order to maintain renewed vitality, maintain a healthy state of mind, body, and soul. And we do that in so many ways, so many ways. Uh, one way, for example, is the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel was used by the American Indians. And uh, it's an ancient technique that is utilized to center yourself to ground yourself, put you in touch with the energies of the earth. And within the shamanistic tradition, the shaman would leave his body, go into the astral realm, talk to the spirits, or procure a particular energy source and bring it back with him or her to the person who was in need or who was ill. And that was done within a sacred circle. So it's always with a circle and the medicine wheel appeal, uh, appears like a, a circle. It looks like um, a bicycle wheel with spokes. Okay. And it's made out of rocks and stones. And it's used to draw down the energy and to focus and to center us. And it's just a brief, very brief description of it. But utilizing it um, is very important to heal ourselves. Now, we're talking about healing ourselves uh, spiritually, uh, healing ourselves uh, emotionally. How about physically? Is that possible through magic also, like physical healing? You're like somebody who might be ill with, like, say, cancer or uh, some, kind of, some other kind of uh, illness? I believe it is. I believe that the energy that exists, and again, we'll go back to the astral realm, mm -hmm. the energy that exists on the astral realm is a life-sustaining energy. And if one is adept enough to pull that energy or draw that energy down, it can be drawn into your physical being or to be placed into another person's physical being. And you hear that done often when people say laying on of hands and also it's known as an artificial element within the Western Mystery School tradition or a thought form within the Wiccan tradition or magical tradition. So yes, I do believe that that can uh, that that is a possibility. Um, <clears throat> I also believe that something else comes into play with that that's very important and necessary to talk about, and that's called destiny. Okay. But again, we have, I, in my opinion so far, from what I've learned, and my philosophy changes daily, um, <laughs> because there, there's this wonderful statement that I like to say, which is that when none of us ever outgrows the need for a teacher, and right. Rice is the best teacher. But um, so we we work fifty fifty with destiny. That's my belief. And uh, if it is someone's destiny to live to a particular age, from what I've seen, it doesn't matter how amazing a magician or a witch is, or if they've been given the ability to pull down energy from the astral realm, the person who is suffering from an illness, if they are meant to pass away at a certain time, they will. Now, that but would negate then free will. I mean, destiny would say, I mean, there, what does that mean with free will? Do we not have free will then? Because we're destined to be here or we're destined to do something that would say that there's no free will. I I would be creator if I could answer that for you. And I often ask. <laughs> I, so you're I not that. So you're not the God that. guy. 
a it, it's a what a wonderful question though, Angel. I mean, I ask myself that all the time, and you know, where does our free will begin or end, and where where does destiny come into play? I mean, destiny is it means destination. In my book, I describe a goal as a destination. You're creating your destiny. You know, I had a vision um, on the astral realm. I had spontaneously left my body and became aware that I was dreaming. So it's called a lucid dream. And I was, when I became aware that I was dreaming, I asked myself, what is destiny? Why are we here? What's going on? And as I had that thought come into my mind, I saw myself as if I was in a chariot traveling through the universe, and I saw this sun rising from the far end of the universe, a galaxy, I should say. And I Would you say it was a galaxy far, life. far away? I'm sorry? Would you say it was a galaxy far, far away? Yeah, <laughs> hey, that was good. But um, boom. a little Star Wars reference there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, it, to uh, to finish the the vision that I had, I looked down to my right and I saw reins, and I knew that I could either pick up the reins and be in control of my destiny somewhat, or I could just mm. leave them. So it was a metaphor for me when I woke up out of that. I journaled that and I thought about it and analyzed it. I thought, wow, you know, I, we are co-creators. We do have 50-50 from my that's experience with destiny. And that's the best metaphor that I could give to describe that. That's our you know, free will. That reminds me a lot, and going back to a reference of Star Wars here, The Empire Strikes Back. Remember the scene in... The, in uh, Dagobah. I don't know if you're a fan of the Star Wars series, but uh, when Luke is on Dagobah training with Yoda and he's going into the cave and he's taking his weapon with him and Yoda tells him, you don't need to take your weapon. You, your destiny is what it is and what you take in there with you is what you're going to bring in there with you. And he goes in there with the weapon and when he gets out of it, he gets the, the face of Vader attacking him uh, because he brought in his own destiny with him. He brought in his, his own uh, war in a sense. Uh, that kind of reminds me of that scene where you just said. Yeah, it's parallel. Yeah, yeah. There was, it, it's fascinating to me, anything with free will and destiny, because it has such an important role in magic. And we question it as a, a human race. We question it often to the point that, look, it's in Star Wars. And yeah, I'm a great <laughs> fan of Star Wars. So <laughs> that was pretty cool that you brought that up. I like I it's a, another great metaphor. Um, you know, it's funny because yeah. I think the the Star Wars trilogy, especially the original trilogy, are just uh, chalked up with uh, magic metaphors and all kinds of stuff. Uh, even like the Force, uh, the, you know, the original explanation for it is just as a magical field that surrounds us and binds us. You know, it's very spiritual and magical. The original Star Wars uh, th theology behind it. Um, you know, a lot of movies do that, though. Do you think that uh, more people in Hollywood are in tuned with, uh, you know, these messages and that's why we see them sprinkled within the movies? Almost certainly, because it, it comes from creativity. Mm, interesting, and yeah. Where does, where does someone create, does creativity come from? That has to come from a spark of divinity or connection mm. with divinity. And then it, it makes you, it inspires you. When you're creative and you're inspired, you have this amazing motivation. And that's when you see someone that is a passionate artist. It's how I wrote my book. I became a passionate artist. I had to write down my experience and I wanted to share them with people. So I think that's the motivating factor and that's the magic that comes from the uh, the creativity. That is the magic. Now, this is the first book you've written, right? Correct. This is the first book I've written, and uh, I also have um, short stories that are. There's a group of short stories that I've written. They're in an electronic magazine that I co-edited. It's called The Familiar, and they are about cool. love, tragedy, and witches and witchcraft. 
Now, what do you think witchcraft and, and witches has such a bad rap in the world? I mean, the witch, witchcraft has been around for, like I said, many, many hundreds of years. So why do you think it's gotten such a bad rap over the last few hundred years? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got about hard. 10 more minutes uh, before we you have 10 more minutes to answer that. <laughs> it, 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 it's not <laughs> gets us into the territory once again of religion and politics and uh, you know the, the two the two uh, most important things that we should not be talking about right <laughs> but uh, yeah it, I, unfortunately it has a, this stigma to it and I think it's because most people think of witches and witchcraft as a person that's made a pact with the devil. Right. Or there's a fear factor in it because there's a level of the unknown mixed with superstition. And unfortunate historical um, incorrect facts that have been brought about through Christianity. Um, and really... If I were to give a, a good example of witchcraft, it would simply be the wise woman who was, um, you know, able to find the herbs that could heal someone that was burned, or the midwife who is helping another woman give birth. And this is just wisdom. It's pure wisdom that's come through age and trial and error and working with herbs and um, understanding the cycles of the earth and nature. So if people look at it in that manner, rather than a pact with the devil, um, I, I think that they'll, they'll feel a little bit more comfortable with it and take out some of the fear factor. As far as you know, though, Lauren, is there a devil being? Is there an entity known as Lucifer, that really exists among us? As far as I know, I have never met or encountered this devil or Satan or anything of that nature. I have encountered on a lucid dreaming level and an astral level my own fears and inner demons that needed to be confronted so that I could have control over them. And we all have those inner demons. And I talk at length in my book about how to gain control by confronting them. Once you have control over that, you're able to remove the obstacles that would hold you back from obtaining success and happiness and fulfillment in all avenues of your life. Really, those fears that we have are fed by society, by uh, a, a force that would want us to believe that we have to suffer in order to obtain something good or would propagate the phrase, oh, money doesn't grow on trees, and, <laughs> you, know, and <laughs> you, you need to have a nine-to-five, and you can't do what you want to do. Don't, don't be ridiculous. All of those concepts are false and stop us from moving ahead. And my book describes how to blow that out of the water because it's what I overcame, and if I can overcome it, anyone can overcome it. That's what I say. And I did it with magic and recreated my life, wrote a book, created that and happiness. So it's possible. And no, I have not encountered the devil. I don't believe that one exists. Just our I'm, own. I'm with you on that. I, I'm not a, I don't believe there's a, a devil being or, or even a God being. I think there is an energy that controls everything, which I guess you could subliminally call him God or call it God or whatever. But I'm with you on the, uh, the whole energy, you know, spectrum uh, that controls the entire universe, that energy field or that grid, or heck, the, the force that controls us all. Right? right? Just like Lucas would Neither. say. 
Lauren, uh, we're we're almost out of time. I really have had a, a lot of fun having you on the show, but I want to definitely give you a chance to uh, also plug your website and, and tell the audience where they can get the book. I know that it's on Amazon, correct? Correct. The book can be purchased through Amazon. It can be purchased through Barnes & Nobles, um, most any New Age bookstore and bookstore. It can also be downloaded on Kindle and Nook. Very cool. Do you have a website that uh, they can give out to the audience in case they want to follow up with uh, your book and other uh, teachings and other stuff that you're working on? Absolutely. I have a workshop coming up on May 31. It's a Saturday. And it's in my store in Pompano Beach here in Florida. And my store is New Moon Books, Crystals, and Candles. And everything that we're talking about, my psychic counseling, my book dragon flame, the workshops, all of that can be, um, all of the information can be found on my website, newmoonbooks.org. And that's N-E-W-M-O-O-N-B-O-O-K-S.org, newmoonbooks.org. Newmoonbooks.org. Sounds very cool. Now, you know, in the book you do go, and just before that you go, I wanted to ask you, you do go into, of course, the moon, the phases of the moon, and all that stuff. Uh, how important is the moon when it comes to uh, to magic overall, though? I mean, what would you place the importance of the moon in general? It's very important. The moon and the sun are the two most visible light sources to us when we look up. So in the evening, we see the moon luminescing on us, and the phases are very important. So we have the phase of the new moon to the full moon, which is called the waxing phase, as it is growing larger. And that's when we do magical workings to bring a particular goal into fruition. There's also the phase when it is growing lesser, which is called the waning phase, so from the full moon to the new moon. And that's when we do creative visualizations or meditations and magic to remove obstacles, to banish uh, any kind of negativity or anything that is harming us in our lives. So it's very important, as is the sun. So, you know, with the moon, we need the sun. We need the opposite they almost like the yin, yin and yang to each other. But the reason about the moon up is, uh, you know, recently we had um, something called the blood moon. Um, you know, do you cover that at all in the book? Is there something that, you, that you've talked about before, the blood moon? And uh, how relevant is that to anything that you've worked on when it comes to magic? Well, all of the full moons uh, are given names. And uh, that particular full moon that you're talking about, the blood moon, um, happens to be given that name because of the usual red aura that is around it and also because of the particular time of year right. that it rises full. So it, it's, but again, here we have this great opportunity now to point out the conscious thought, this group consciousness that when you say full blood moon, people think of that, so you have a lot of people that are looking at their calendars, saying to themselves, wow, there's something called a full blood moon that's going to happen, and so they, they're creating a group consciousness that exists in an area in the astral realm, so that can be tapped into, hmm. so it, and it creates a, a particular form of power that can be tapped into. And there's going to be the group consciousness that's curious and fearful, and then there's going to be the group consciousness that understands how to work with the energy. So reading and knowledge is power, right? So read about it, learn about it, so that you can utilize that energy properly for yourself without the fear and without any of the superstition with it. Makes sense. You know, Art Bell a long time ago did an experiment on his show that uh, uh, where he had a, a mass 
group of people, you know, his audience basically. Uh, they were they were trying to get rain in a certain state, and they all concentrated and they talked about it on the air for a while, and and it started raining, you know, heavily. Uh, to the point that it scared him, and he stopped doing those kind of experiments with his listeners on air. Uh, I do believe there's a power of of consciousness, and we can manifest, and and we could change our surroundings just by our, our very conscious thought. Uh, I mean, that definitely to believe that all that is uh, an untapped resource that we have as humanity, uh, which is uh, it'd be interesting if that's part of our next step in our evolution, which a lot of this I think would lead to the next step of our evolution. You think? I, I believe that that is the next step in our evolution is spiritual progress. Yeah. And spiritual progress means learning how to work together. As soon as there is an absence of a physical body, then we suddenly realize that we're all one. We're from the same energy source. Right, same source, yeah. So our, our minds are all connected. We can all think about the same thing simultaneously. We can't touch it physically simultaneously, not all of us at the same time. So we're headed into that direction to understand the connection between the third dimension in the physical body and our connection to divinity and our, the ability that we're more than our physical body. So these five senses that we have, I believe that we're going to evolve into a race that understands and utilizes the sixth sense and beyond. It would be very interesting to see how it happens, and I'm not quite sure if we'll be alive to see it, Angel, but you know, <laughs> it's definitely it's happening, that's for sure. It's happening. There more and more people are interested in it. Yeah, no kidding. And, you know, a lot of this stuff also uh, correlates, I think, and w we will see in the future as, you know, we do evolve more, uh, that it will correlate even to other things like our space brothers, aliens, for example. Uh, I do believe a lot of them are spiritually more advanced than we are, and that's part of the reason why we don't know about them on a disclosed or a disclosure level, because the spiritual levels that we are are not completely there with them yet. Um, you know, and I'm sure in your astral projections, you see not just human beings. I'm sure you've seen other beings as well because I mean a lot of people who have astral projected have come forward saying they've seen the classic greys and they've seen other forms of you know intelligent life as the astral project has that happened to you as well when you astral project what you have on your mind is what you're going to immediately encounter and so that's not good for me though let me tell you Lauren that can't be good for me <laughs> for a lot of people right <laughs> uh, that's where I, I was about to follow it up quickly with until you learn to surrender to your higher self. And the higher self is a higher aspect of us, a kind of angelic source and connection to divinity that takes over and guides us when we leave our body. And I have encountered um, entities, or I'm not even quite sure what to call them, um, they when I encountered it, I thought, oh, well, you know, this would be why people believe that aliens exist. Right. And I believe that alien could be defined as just what it means, something foreign, it's something that's unknown, and it, it, it exists on an astral level. And I keep bringing that up because it, it was the first step. And, well, one of the... Uh, it's the the area that exists before we do. Right. It needed to exist in order for us to exist. It's the step above us heading into a more spiritual path or process. But yeah, I believe that that is, if there are aliens, they, that is where they would be able to travel about freely because it's another dimension. It makes perfect sense. Lauren, thank you so much for being on the show here with us and spending the hour with us. I really appreciate your time. And again, everybody, the book is called Dragon Flame, and the author is Lauren Leo. Please check uh, his work out on Amazon.com. And uh, once again, Lauren, uh, give us your website address one more time before we let you go. I'm sorry? I couldn't hear you. Sure. Give us your website address one more time before we let you go for the evening. Sure. It's newmoonbooks.org. 
newmoonbooks.org. Everybody, please check the website out. Uh, Lauren, again, thank you so much for spending your time here with me, man. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to have uh, people from uh, Warwick join us here on the show, and uh, you've been great. Uh, I'm going to definitely go through the book uh, again, and uh, I'm going to uh, follow up with you. And when you have another book, please uh, contact us so we can have you back on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Aaron and Angel. May the force be with you. 